Welcome everybody to That Poker Podcast, episode 121 for April 13th, 2022. I'm your host, H. Schwartz, alongside producer extraordinaire with the white t-shirt, the go-to white t-shirt in contrast with the beard and the backwards black ball cap. This is Roscoe P. Coltrane. Well, you have one way of describing it. I have another. That's a good drop. I appreciated that one. Uh, Terrence there you go. Ken in, uh, in, in, in lovely Kelowna, BC. Terrence, how are that you? That is correct. I'm, I'm doing very well. You know, Adam, I was just thinking, we've been playing poker a long time. We talk about this a lot. You know, you and Daniel since probably like the early 90s, myself since like the late 90s. We've seen poker strategy evolve over yes. the years just so much. So this and, but, but now, here in the year 2022, I, I mean, I've been playing poker almost 25 years. Now we get to learn about the power of queen four offsuit as a three bet calling it offhand. Mm -hmm. I, I just, this game, this, this is why we do, why we play this game because every, there's always an opportunity to learn more about in-depth right. strategy and the state of the game continues to evolve. Queen four offsuit, put it in your three bet call it off range because it is, it is there. The goat has, has made it so. So I you think that I'm there for power. Right? <laughs> because as you say, poker changes. People do things and you go, that can't be right. And then it turns out to be right. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, with also Daniel Negreanu in Las Vegas. Daniel, how are you, sir? It's funny you mentioned that because I, I know we'll get to it, but wait till I tell you, because we all make fun of Phil because he's in the studio for like days. Wait till I tell you the two rationalizations he had for this week four. Okay. It's going to blow your mind. Okay. We'll get to it. And I know you guys that are listening to the podcast now, you definitely want to hang in there because it's mind boggling. Like his, <laughs> wait till I tell you what he said about it. But yeah, so he, I'm not going to lie. Like I watched, you know, I played with him in the 50 K and I'm going to, I can say this, listen, he, he has this problem with me talking about his poker game and, you know, takes it personal. Like, meanwhile, he tells Chino, you know, you're the worst poker player at the table. You're terrible. Yeah. Why'd you, yeah. For a hand that was completely standard. So it's okay for him to do. Yeah. And I don't, it's not personal. I don't dislike the guy. I get along with him. But sometimes he plays like absolute shit, right? And he was like by far in the 50K, like by a distant, there were seven players at the table. He was a distant ninth in terms of like the worst <laughs> player at the table. And he did some shit. Like people just like, what the fuck? He ran so hot. He still didn't cash in that one. But he lost one pot where he had the best hand. The guy rivered him and was like, oh, you see? You see, Daniel? You see what I go through? I'm like, all the money went in on the fucking river when you were beat. You anyway. <laughs> But we'll get to that later. We'll but talk. We got a lot to talk about. With a lot of crazy game. hands played this week that we can oh, get. Oh my god! It's the week of bad poker, and, and I don't say that because I play bad poker. I know we all play bad poker at some point. We watched High Stakes Poker uh, episode five and six this week, and my mind was literally blown. Like, you, you know, you'd think back to High Stakes Poker uh, series one, Daniel, season one, where you played and. And, you know, uh, admittedly, I would suggest that you would say that the level of play back in season one was a distant uh, cousin to the poker that's played today. Um, I think episode five and six was a throwback to season one where you look at it and you go, what the fuck? How did this happen? And we'll talk about it. And there's some, you know, there's, uh, let, let's, let's say, some um, sensitive discussion to be had around uh, uh, Doyle Brunson specifically, right? I mean, this is a guy who's been at the top of the poker game, or poker world for a long time. Um, but if you watch him now, and I know, you know, uh, he's he's done very well, and and he'll pick his spots, and he's done. But but this week, it, uh, I I watched it, and I felt bad. I felt bad for a man who's getting older, um, who may be. Uh, but we'll get there. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. And and um, and I know everybody's probably got opinions on that. But uh, all right. So let's jump in. First, actually, before we jump into the poker, I wanted to just quickly mention um, for those that have been watching the F1 documentary on uh, on Netflix, uh, F1 is coming to Las Vegas and the strip of Las Vegas is going to be the track, uh, I think, around Harmon and and the strip uh, as well for 10 year. Uh, I think it's like a billion dollar 10 year deal. F1 to Las Vegas is fantastic. I'm not a huge F1 guy. I like it. It's fun to watch and I don't get into it. I could probably name two drivers, but you don't watch the show. Fun. No, I've watched a little bit of it, but uh, watching the F1 it. cars go down to Las Vegas Boulevard, how fucking awesome is that going to be? Like, uh, I don't know, Daniel, are you pumped for, for F1 in Vegas? No, I don't give a shit whatsoever. <laughs> I could care less. But what I do care about Ross is Ross, keep my wife's 
name out your fucking mouth. My wife. My wife. My- <laughs> I don't know. I just thought we'd throw that in there because it's been a week since yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, what did Ross do? I was like, yeah. I, I didn't even crack him, crack him in. I just joke. wanted to say that and I picked Ross because I figure he's the most like, like Terrence might fight me. I don't know. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Not that far removed from MMA. Adam, I should have said it to you because you're all skinny now, right? You know, yeah, you, you can beat me up. Yeah. Pretty, pretty sure that would happen. I'm, trying to th- I'm trying to think of a movie that, that Amanda could, could, could be in. <laughs> That I can make a dumb joke. Okay, about. Well, well, you think of your best Amanda joke for next Amanda week. Amanda does Dallas. You've got a week now. Right. <laughs> yeah, I want to say, actually, you know, obviously everybody and their dog is talking about the Will Smith, Chris Rock stuff. But the part as a Canadian I don't really understand is this uh, Chris Rock doesn't want to tra- press charges. So he's not going to be charged. And I'm thinking, the fuck? Like, why is it up to Chris Rock if somebody who, like, take that to an extreme where he actually jumps on top of him and kicks the shit out of him in front of, I don't know, a billion people, and Chris Rock says, no, nah, I'm good, we're not going to, tra- I don't want to charge him. What the fuck? That's a I don't clear know. That's assault. That's a touchy one. I, I did a radio interview about, it's funny, I did a radio interview and it's about Pocky, but all they wanted to fucking talk about was this, right? Yeah. But if you haven't seen it, SNL this week, I'd never heard of this comedian before, his name's Gerard, Gerard uh, Carmichael. He yeah. did the intro for SNL this week. He was hilarious. He talked about this for seven, six, seven minutes, but like never mentioned it. He's like, I'm not going to talk about it. You're not going to get me to talk about it. And I won't talk about it. But let's just, this happened. It happened six days ago. So he actually talks about it without talking about it. It's <laughs> quite freaking humorous. He's, I highly he's very recommend funny. I, You know, you could probably find it on Twitter if you go to SNL. It's like six minute bit. Really funny. He's got a great delivery. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to ruin it, but yeah. Um, but no, I don't know. Like the thing with Chris Rock, here's the thing, right? So I'll talk about it for two seconds. I like, it depends what it is. Obviously, Adam, what you're talking about is if you beat the shit out of him, whatever. Right. But it was like, it was a slap. Right. Yeah. So obviously Chris Rock has the right to press charges if he chooses to, but if he chooses not to, in a case like this, I'm sort of okay with it. Having said sure. that, what if, would it have been different if he did that to Amy Schumer or he did that to somebody who's like in a lower position that may need a job with Will Smith and doesn't want to upset Will Smith so that, you know, they're, they're, they're dealing with somebody who's in a higher position. It's a complicated subject, but like, I still have, cause I'm a hockey guy, a little bit of that old school, kind of like two guys getting a beef. One guy says some shit, he slaps him. He's like, all right, whatever. I can, maybe I deserve that. Let's go have a beer type thing. Right. So if it was a case like that, I, I feel like, I don't feel like, the, the, you know, like, you know, the, he needs to be charged with something if Chris, if for, for what he did, if Chris, unless Chris Rock said, cause I slapped Chino at the world series this year, like joking, <laughs> Like slapping, like what is like the police going to come and charge me? Cause I did slap him. I was joking. Chino's cool with it. Now that's not this case, but I do think there's nuance and I don't think it's like black and white. You one man slaps other man in the face, gets charged with something. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, all right, let's jump into, we got a lot of poker to get to this week. So we're going to jump into high stakes poker episode five and six. Um, uh, the lineup uh, episode five starts with Patrick Antonius, Doyle Brunson, uh, Tom Dwan, uh, Jennifer Tilly, uh, Garrett Adelstein, uh, Joan Liu, and Chris Menon, and Kim Holtzman rounds it out. Um, and I've got the stack sizes there in the show notes, guys. And I just wanted to get your, without, I, I just want to post them and get your take on, this is how we started the stack sizes for this um, this round. Uh, Garrett Adelstein's at the top, and Tom Dwan is at, uh, Garrett has 300,000, Tom has 100,000. He's got the uh, smallest stack. Um, first of all, t- Terrence, why don't you start? What, what are your thoughts on the stack sizing? If you're somebody like Tom Dwan, um, playing against Jennifer Tilly, Chris Menon, uh, Kim Holtman, who are, you know, uh, obviously recreational players and Tom and Doyle and such who have less than them are not. Yeah. The, the sort of general poker theory is that you should kind of be, if, if you're comfortable playing deep, which obviously Tom is, then you should have about as much as the you know the weaker players at the table um that can be mitigated against i don't remember the exact seat positions like if, if strong players have position on you maybe you don't want to do that because you don't want to play super deep with the people on your left generally if they're good players um but i, I don't know i can't go into to what what tom is thinking there but yeah generally you want to have stack sizes that that match the weaker players that said i don't i think 
Um, this episode five is a continuation from episode four, but I think it's still the same session. I don't think they actually took any break. Right. I don't think these were the actual buy-ins. So it's just a matter of when Jen wins a big pot and doubles up, do you want to be the guy who says, ah, give me another hundred thousand over here just, uh, and make it really obvious that you're just trying to match her stack because you think you can filter because, you know, I, I it, it feels like even though this is like a, a high stakes cash game, it's, it's, it's not like super cutthroat in that kind of way. And the people who are super cutthroat aggressively enough probably aren't going to be invited back. I mean, you can just kind of tell by the lineup, this is kind of, you know, there are professionals in this game, but it's not, it's not meant to be like a, a, a best of the best exhibition here. So maybe it's not in, in the best taste to immediately top up, but I mean, you can, you can be Tom Dwan. And, and after, after a few pots go the, the way of the weaker players, you can, you can buy in for another hundred thousand if that's what you want to do. Yeah, I think a big part of it, you know, is Garrett Adelstein, who will mm. always have the table covered, right? So for him, there's no, it's not off, it's not weird, like, oh, he's putting chips on. He just always, right. no matter what, wants the, you know, the table covered. Possibly, you know, I don't remember the exact positions, but possibly, you know, Tom, that, you know, that played into Tom's decision to not, because Garrett wants to play deep, right? He's a cash game guy, he wants to play as deep as possible and, you know, have as many weapons available. He's good. In the river, and he's very, very good, right? But everything you said, Terrence, is absolutely right for those listening and learning, like, how much should you buy in for? You know, how many chips? Like, obviously your bankroll plays a role in terms of like, you know, how much you want to risk. But but more importantly is like you said, who are the weaker players? How much do they have in front of them? And who are the better players? And how much do they have in front of them? And what position are you in? So if you're like, if you're super deep, like 300 big lines deep and the best player in the table is right behind you, 300 big lines deep, no, that's bad for you. So you definitely would want to buy in for the minimum in that case, even if, you know, you know there, there's some potentially valuable spots to, to be had with some weaker players. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think that, honestly, I don't think Tom was even thinking about any of that. He just bought in for 100 because that's the buy-in. So, I mean, he could have been, but I doubt it. I think he was just playing. Okay. Uh, first hand, let's get into it. Uh, Doa Brunson, he is in middle position. He limps with the Ace of Hearts, Eight of Diamonds. Uh, that's two red, uh, two red cards, and this will be important later. Uh, Jennifer Tilly limps right behind him, uh, him with the King Seven of Clubs. Patrick Antonius on the button has two tens and he raises both of them call. Uh, the flop comes King four deuce with two diamonds. Uh, so Jennifer Tilly, uh, she flops top pair with the King seven of clubs. Uh, Patrick has a uh, second pair with his tens and Doyle flops nothing. Uh, again, King four deuce, two diamonds. It goes check, check, check. The turn is the Jack of hearts. Uh, Doyle checks. Jennifer Tilly now bets 3,000 into 8,500 with her top pair. Patrick folds, just outright folds. Um, and Doyle check raises to 15,000. Um, Jennifer calls. So uh, he's sort of picked a spot here where it really looks like, unless Jennifer has exactly King Jack, she's probably got a weak King or some sort of King 10 or the hand she's got, King 8, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, guys, first thoughts on the uh, flop play and the turn play by both both Doyle and Jen. Uh, Daniel, why don't you go first there? I mean, really? Wow. Like, you know, so for what we preface by saying, you know, part of what you both were talking about in terms of like the, the, the caliber of play and like, you know, we compare it to the old days, we compare it to modern solver like kids today. And uh, these games still exist, right? <laughs> They're just difficult to get into, right? Like these people play high stakes poker all the time. They just do so without really good players. So yeah, nothing really makes, I mean, obviously I, I don't even remember. I, I was really just focused on Doyle's play here. Yeah. And even if he had like the hand he thought he had, which was ace eight of diamonds, still not, not a great play. Doyle was clearly like, here's the thing, right? When you get to 88, you're going to notice that, you know, if you're still playing poker, some days you're sharp and guess what? Other days you might not be quite as sharp because yeah. I was, I was impressed. I played the first session with Doyle. I thought he played great. I really genuinely, like, I left saying, Doyle was good, like, really good, you know? And then, you know, obviously, I'm watching some of these sessions that I wasn't involved with, and he was just not all there. But that's to be expected of an older guy, right? He's just sort of, like, to a lesser, you know, he's playing off instinct. He's sort of clicking buttons a little bit, making some plays. I thought his comment was rather interesting. You know, save those time banks. Yeah. Like so that. let's get there. So why don't we do that? Um, so again, he check raises the turn. Jennifer calls with her top pair. There's 38. The river comes to three spades. It's a blank. Uh, there's 38,000 in the middle. Doyle bets 26,300. And Jen goes into the tank with her top pair, no kicker. 
And after she's in the tank a while, as you said, Daniel, he says, better save them, your time extension. So he's clearly maybe trying to, to he knows she's got top pair at this point. I think she even says, I have a king or something like that. You, and she says, you're really committed to your story. And Doyle's trying to think of how am I going to get her to fold this hand? And he says something like, you better save them, your time extensions. Um, and then uh, he says, or no, actually Jennifer says, you bet 25,000 on the river. And he jumps in, he says, no, I bet 27,000. So, you know, between the, you better save your extensions and uh, I bet more, you know, I bet 27,000. She turns, I don't know if that meant anything to Jen, if that, that it talked her into calling or whatever, but Jen, as she likes to talk about herself, uh, tends to like to hit push the call button and she does so and she wins. And then Doyle says, to your point, Daniel, earlier, he says, uh, after the hand, I've got four diamonds. Um, and I was wondering, you know, uh, what you thought if he's actually telling the truth there or did he actually misread his hand or is he, cause he doesn't show his hand. He just kind of mucks it. And well, maybe he, he's listen, kinda... there's so much precedent in this season and other that he misread his hand several times. Like there was a hand where he called a flop with queen five on like King 10, seven. Cause he thought he had queen nine. Like, listen, you know, his eyes are bad. He's older. I believe wholeheartedly that he had the ace eight of diamonds, frankly with Jennifer's hand. Against Doyle, historically, you you know, it's, this play's supposed to work, frankly, right? Yeah. Like, even though it was a kooky cockamamie play, like, Doyle's rarely bluffing with the check raise on the turn and a bet on the river, and your king sevens just shriveled up to nothing. It's not, you know, it doesn't beat anything whatsoever. So, yeah. uh, inadvertently, it was probably supposed to work, and, you know, Jen found the call somehow. Maybe she read into the old, you know, you know Doyle tell that he gave away. Because how often are people going to say that? You know, save your money, kid, you know, I have you when they actually do. Typically, that's a sign that people want you out and they want you out because their hand's not that strong. Now, it's not always the case. Masters of, you know, table talk will mix that up. But uh, yeah, that one seemed pretty genuine to me. And if, when he said that, I thought, oh boy. Yeah. I mean, I could see it, obviously, but it was like, oh. Yeah, that yeah I, I think out. like correcting the 25K to the 27K, uh, as Adam mentioned, is even maybe arguably more of a tell because that's a, a tend to thing that you want to do is, no, it's actually going to cost you a little bit more, which yeah. is a subconscious sort of thing. Like, no, you don't, you don't want this, honey. Um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to think that Doyle thinks he has the ace. Of First of all, I don't think like Doyle's kind of old school when it comes to the off offsuit aces. I don't think he's just going to play like an, an ace eight offsuit in early position to begin with. And, and definitely not for a limp. It, it, like it's it, that like the story is very, the way he plays the hand is just so much more consistent with having the ace eight of diamonds than it is just randomly making like think a, about Doyle. When has Doyle ever made a play like that in any cash game in the history of Arch? He's never done that. Right. Ever. So it's a hundred percent, you know, a mystery. And when Adam says like on the turn, you know, talked about earlier, like if, you know, if, if Jen doesn't specifically have, have King Jack, like it's putting a lot of pressure. Well, I mean, there's no reason that she's checking to the razor. There's no reason she can't only have not just King Jack, but also pocket fours, pocket deuces. Like there's, she's, she's not uncapped really here um, in this spot. So yeah, I don't I, like, that's why I think Daniel says it's kind of a, like, a, like a wacky move because there's no reason that, that Jen actually just can't have a, a pretty large hand here or, or get sticky with a king, apparently. And, and we're going to see this the whole way through. Jen Tilly yeah. did not show up today to fold top pair or to fold <laughs> one pair, to be honest. <laughs> well, she didn't, and she catches everybody bluffing, and it makes it harder for her to fold, right? <laughs> she keeps, yeah. keeps catching everybody. I, I mean, like you're going you're gonna to go through a bunch of hands, and, and Jen, Jen is not here to fold a pair. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Uh, all right, so here's in the next hand, very next hand. Ooh, I don't know if it's the next hand being played. It seems unlikely because this is an edited show. But the next hand they show um, after Doyle does that, I don't know if he notices when he throws his hand away that he doesn't have the ace eight of diamonds or what. But he he really kind of seems to go on a little bit of tilt here, and and that's it goes beyond sort of misreading his hand to playing hands that he probably normally wouldn't play to Dan's point. Maybe he's on having a, a bad day at 88 years old. Um, so uh, Garrett Adelstein raises under the gun to 1200 with two jacks. Juan Lu three bets to 3,600 right behind him with the queen 10 of clubs. Doyle cold calls three bets with the ace four hearts. So again, a suited, uh, suited ace. Uh, Jennifer Tilly uh, calls now with the queen nine of hearts. There's a whole bunch of people in the pot. She sees the pot building. Uh, it gets back to Garrett, and he makes it 20,000. He makes it 20,000 with the two jacks. Remember, he got three bet by Juan. Uh, Juan folds now. Uh, Doyle calls with the ace four hearts, and Gentilly folds. Um, 
so interesting spot here where Garrett uh, makes it 20,000 in this particular spot. Daniel, I want to ask you about this, about Doyle's call here. While it <laughs> seems kind of horrendous <laughs> sort of on its face, I mean, is Garrett skewed to King's Aces uh, here where, you know, if he banks an ace, maybe he's going he's gonna to take down the pot? Okay, so it's interesting hand, right? So Doyle has what I call like the solver kid's best excuse hand to spew right so if you look at a solver it, it generally especially pre-flop the bluffs that you're going to have for like three betting four betting five betting or six betting if there's any bluffs they're always going to be a suited wheel card the reason for that is a you block aces right and b if they don't have aces ace four suited gives you the you know the best amount of the most amount of equity against the hands that are going to you know get you're going to get in with it whether it's ace king queens aces you know, queens or, you know, jacks or something like that. Having said that, right, the solver kids would not flat the hand. Like, that's <laughs> not a bluff. Like, as we've learned in poker, calling someone on the river is not a bluff. That is, that is not a – like, I've heard people say that. I was like, ah, oh, I bluffed you. Who do you call? That's not a bluff, right? So this was like – so here's the thing with Doyle, right? Doyle, if you look – Doyle likes suited hands, right? Period. He likes suited hands. He always has. Plays a lot of suited hands in cash games and things like that. Suited ace, little hot sucker, trying to get even maybe, just gambling it up, you know, not thinking about the depth of game theory in terms of like, you know, um, stack to pot ratio and the fact that he doesn't have enough behind to justify this. Because like, I bet you there's a world where you're deep enough where you can call. Like say if you're, you know, you're both a thousand big blinds deep, maybe, you know, it's fine, but not at the depths that they were at. So yeah, it's just a spewy call. Now, Garrett's hand makes sense, right? He gets three bet. He gets, a, you know, two cold callers. So it's like a really good opportunity to pick up the dead money if Schwan doesn't have, you know, if Schwan, now if Schwan four bets after that, you know, you, it'll be a tough spot for Jax. But I think it's a, I think it's almost a must when you get two cold callers that unlikely to have aces, kings, or queens to, to re-raise there with the Jax and try to get it through Schwan. So from Garrett's perspective, normal. And then Doyle just... You know, that's just a little too much. That's just Lucy Goo. Like he called the first one. He's like, ah, fuck this kid. I'm calling again. <laughs> I'm tilting. I wonder if Juan four bets if Doyle calls again. <laughs> That'd be the no, interesting. No, I don't think so. Because it would have been too big of a yeah, no way. Okay, I mean, she just well, has aces or kings. Like if she if she if she that's a five bet, by the way, if if she's in. Uh, she just has aces or kings. Like <laughs> uh so again, Garrett has jacks, Doyle has the ace four hearts. We're off to a flop. Uh, for 20,000 heads up, and the flop comes 4-4-3. So Doyle goes from way behind to way ahead in a big hurry. 4-4-3, uh, two clubs. Garrett Adelstein uh, bets 15,000. He down bets. Uh, Doyle just calls, of course. He's got the nuts. Uh, the turn comes the seven of clubs, making bringing a flush. Uh, Garrett checks. Doyle now shoves for 57,000, and Garrett calls and loses, gets shown the ace, uh, the ace four. I think they run it twice. Doyle makes full house and wins the other one. So Doyle wins both. Um, but yeah, just just a sort of a head scratcher there. And and, and Garrett, uh, to his uh, credit, is you know giving Doyle credit. Hey, I can't believe I'm on high stakes poker playing, making these decisions against Doyle. It's pretty awesome. Um, so continuing on to Twilight Zone, uh, the next hand. <laughs> Um, Chris Manon is playing and, and we'll get to this hand. So, uh, Jennifer Tilly under the gun with the ace king off. She makes it 2,500. I believe there's a straddle. Um, uh, Kim calls with the nine, or sorry, Chris calls with the nine, 10 of clubs. Juan Lu has Jax in the small blind. She three bets to 11,500. Um, Jennifer Tilly with the ace king off just flat calls. And that brings, uh, Chris in and he calls again with the nine, 10 of clubs. So it's Jax, ace king off and the nine, 10 of clubs, the flop. The uh, pot is 36,000. The flop comes with the dry king seven deuce rainbow. No uh, club. Nope. Yeah. King seven deuce rainbow. Oh, was it one club? No club. No club. Oh, no clubs. Yeah. Um, and again, <laughs> yes, it's a good point because Chris has nine, 10 of clubs. Uh, Jennifer, obviously top flops, top pair. And uh, Juan has jacks for the underpair. So uh, again, so uh, king seven deuce. Juan checks now. Uh, Jennifer Tilly bets 15,000 into 36,000. And Chris decides to just shove for 110,000 on the King Seven Deuce with the nine ten of clubs. He's got nine. He's got. I, I remember eight. watching this live and thinking, okay, a obviously this is like we've never ever seen a punt like this before. 
like this is the this is like punt of all punts. This is like a yeah. this is the, this is a three hundred yard punt. Okay, <laughs> it's three hundred yard punt. We've never seen anyone quite do this with like no equity whatsoever. And as right. I'm watching it live, I'm thinking, oh my god, is this three hundred yard punt going to work? <laughs> like, is Jennifer going to lay down the ace king? After like having called off and called off, like, is this the one she t- tanked for quite a long time? She, she has the time bank pressure, right? Because that's they decided to play with the time bank pressure. Like, you could see a world where you know, old school Gentilly, you know, check that Jack's full on right. Poker Dark. Everyone's like, This, I thought for a moment Jen was gonna actually fold the ace king <laughs> and you know, he was gonna get away with it. But holy shit, man, like, you just don't, you, you don't see this. Like, I watch a lot of the Poker Ghost streams. You don't see hands like this, man. It's uh, so cool. <laughs> no pair, no draw. Like no pair, no draw. <laughs> Just yeah. rip one hundred and ten or a hundred thousand in uh, over the fifteen thousand dollar bet. Chan eventually finds the call and and wins that. Obviously, both of those they run it twice, I think too. But uh, but yeah, you know, you just wonder, like like you said, Daniel, these games are still out there, right? And and again, I, I go back to the stack size, and I'm just thinking, why doesn't everybody have, you know, everybody who thinks. You know, they're, they're well, let me say this. This is this is why private games took off, and that'll that's just the norm now, right? Because you can create games like this, yeah. right? You can. Whereas if you didn't, you know, have private games and stuff like that, and all games were open, like it would be very difficult for a collection of people who are all sort of like at a similar skill level to play high stakes poker without the waiting list or the seats being full. Like I remember when I first started playing at Bellagio, you know, me, Mickey, Lenny, whatever, Steve, you we start three handed, you know, and then like a we get a you know a tourist, all the seats would fill up with pros, right? That's what would happen to these people if they played just the way they went to the casino and played. So as much as it sucks that private games are the thing or you know the way that it is now, you can understand why. Like a lot of these guys, they don't want to be picked off like that. So like Jen, right? I mean, she probably does fine in these games. And you know, you see, obviously, if she was playing you know only wizard lineups, you know, that's just not it's not fun either, right? Like this is fun. You got guys who are just getting it in there with the 10, nine and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's great to see, but I, I get the frustration if you're a pro and you don't have a game like that to play in. Cause you're like, what the fuck, man, I'm fun. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm cool. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> I got to battle the wizards every day. And here this is going on in some poker go studio. Uh, all right. So uh, the next hand we'll get to here, uh, Doyle opens with the ACE nine off. He makes it 1200. Uh, Jen Tilly has the six of diamonds, three of diamonds. She calls. Uh, Patrick on the button with Queens, three bets to 4,500. Uh, Doyle and Jen both call. The flop is Jack Jack six. Uh, so, um, you know, again, Patrick has Queens. Uh, Jen Tilly has the six three of diamonds. Uh, so she flops two pair. Doyle completely whips with the ace nine off. Doyle checks. Jen bets into the razor with the two pair. He bet, she bets 6,000 into 14,500. Patrick makes it 16,000 with the Queens. Uh, Doyle folds. Uh, Jen re-raises to 46,000. Jennifer Tilly did not come here to fold pairs. Not. She has two pair. She's making it 46,000. She's turning her hand into a bluff at this point, for sure. And Patrick chuckles and throws the two queens into the muck. And I just, my head exploded. I was like, what the fuck just happened? How, and, and I want to actually, before we quickly touch on this hand, guys, and I know, hey, we're not here to throw people under the bus. Patrick Antonius has been a great player for uh, decades. He's been one of the guys that's been around the high stakes. I'm not sure how much he's high stakes he plays now. He was a crusher for a long time. Um, is he still a crusher? Because I'm watching some of these, uh, you know, poker, uh, uh, these high stakes poker episodes, and I'm, I've got to say, and again, I'm not fucking the best poker player in the world, but I'm not super, uh, you know, impressed with how Patrick's playing these days. Daniel, I'm going to ask you to make a little comment on Patrick here. What do you think yeah. of his play overall? So here's the thing, right? And this, I, I mentioned this on Twitter and people blasted me for it. And all, what I said was, um, if you play against really bad players consistently, you develop some bad habits, right? That are, you know, that if you wouldn't, that if you played against really, really sharp players, you know, you could improve your game. Not saying that you should, not saying you have to, but if you play against really weak competition a lot, you know, you start to develop some bad habits. And I think that's what happens with Patrick in, in you know, he plays in these games with a lot of weaker players quite often so that he makes this play, raising the flop, feeling like Jennifer would never three bet here without a jack, right? Which is a reasonable assumption, right? Like if you raise, you know, if you raise Jennifer, you don't think she's ever three betting without actually having three jacks, do you? No. 
But the question is, is Queens a good hand to essentially turn into a bluff here? Are you raising to find out where you're at? Like it's, you know, 1998 or something like that. Like that's essentially what this raise is. Got to find out if she's got the jack, you know, and then you found out, oh, she's got the jack and now you have to fold. I think especially against a player like Jennifer, you know, with the six, like you, I think you're supposed to just let her blast off when you have the Queens. Let this her blast is all because off. of the props. She'll bet the turn. She'll probably bet the river too. And you can go call, 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 you know, um, but he elected to play it really strangely. Like, and here's the thing. Even if you went like call call and he folds the river, if Jennifer if Jennifer finds that third barrel and bombs the river and Patrick like grudgingly lays it down, I don't think we're tearing into him. I think we like we can say like okay, you were a wrong read, but it's like it's not that awful. But like when you go raise and then fold to the three back, that's an exploit that's gone yes. horribly wrong. Yeah, I was gonna say that's exactly what it is. it's a hundred percent an exploit, right? Now when you when you make it and, it and it's a good exploit against a lot of people because there's a whole lot of people that if you raise that flop, you know. They're never going to three bet you without the jack. So it's so it could actually make a lot of sense, right? As we can see now with Jennifer and the mental state she was, it was like a bad read on Patrick's part. But overall, like, you know, you don't want to poo-poo too much to play because I'm sure that this play works on a very high percentage of people. Like, frankly, I'll tell you what, most pros won't even have a three betting range on a jack-jack six in that spot. They literally won't. They just don't. They're just going to always fold or call you know, the raise there. So you get control of the hand. So very shocked. I think he was to go, holy shit, she three bet. Well, fuck, I guess that's now you think about it. What range three bets you think it's a Jack, you know, pocket sixes or, or it's like a flush draw. So against that range, you're not doing very good. What else is there? A fucking six, three off. Like <laughs> who puts her on that? So like, I, so I don't like the raise from Patrick, but once he does, I kind of like the fold. Although, although if you do put her on, you can call, and you know, see if she fires the turn because if she if she is goofing around, it's very unlikely that she's going to do it again on the turn. So you could like find out where you're at by calling there. But Patrick was just sure that she just never does this without a jack. You know, when he makes the fold, and if he was right, you know, this hand wouldn't even be on the docket. We're just like, oh yeah, good. You know, found out where he's at. Terrence, I want to ask you specifically about Jen's play here because uh, if you think back pre-flop, Patrick three bets the open under the gun um, with you know, on the Jack, Jack six board, how many Jacks does he have in his range? Right. So for Jen to think, Oh, I'm going to bet out here. He's going to raise me. I can sell him on the fact that I have a Jack, but he doesn't probably have a Jack unless it's like quad Jack. Seems not going to play it like that. Maybe he's got ace Jack suited, I guess, occasionally, but it seems like there's not a lot of Jacks. In... Uh, he has, he has all the suited Jack Broadway combos. Yeah. I don't think Jen's thinking that. Yeah. I mean, even if that's the case, like, yeah, I don't think that's what Jen's thinking. I just, I just think I think it was one of those. And Daniel used to call him the uh, the fuck this guy raise. I th- I kind of think it was a fuck this guy raise. To be honest, you know the, fu- the fuck this guy raise happens a lot. Like I watch actually. It's funny you mentioned this because I was playing with uh, Phil Helmuth and Ali Amstrovich at the same table, and like Ali was like absolutely destroying him, and Phil was making it a point to try to like fuck you raise him, <laughs> like and fuck you call him down in spots that like made no sense. You know, as he was like bleeding away to Ali. But it's a thing for sure. When you when you plan against somebody you think might be good, you know, often your brain takes you to this place where you try something outside the box. Ah, fuck it. Let's just do it without any logic or theory that, you know, backs it up. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll move on to the next hand here. <clears throat> uh, Garrett, uh, it's folded around Garrett in late position. He raises with the jack eight. He opens it to 1,200 with jack eight off. Uh, Jennifer Tilly has the straddle. Everybody falls to Jen in the straddle. She has the queens where she flat calls. Um, which, you know, obviously you're going to mix in, I guess, a couple of, of calls here to try and play, play it a little bit differently rather than three bet. I guess you three bet most of the time, but there's, there's maybe some mixed in uh, calls. Okay. Is there, is there a mixed Daniel? I think uh, it's a hundred percent three bet. Pretty much. I'd say there isn't two percent. The way you mix is not, is not like just, just flatting with awesome hands. Like the way, the, the, the way that you mix is just like three betting with weak with some right. You, you're mixing there is adding the ace four suited. Right. The, like, yeah. I'm trying to give Jennifer a break here because we might uh, okay. give her a hard time here in this. <laughs> I'm trying to. I love Jennifer. I think she's awesome, and I don't. I want do. To. We all do, but I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah. I think it's 100 race. It's it. okay. So she flats with the queens again. Garrett has the jack eight off. The flop comes jack jack nine. Um, so Garrett flops the world, and uh, Jen checks. Garrett bets 2,000. Uh, Jennifer check raises to 6,000 with the queens and jacks. 
And Garrett, of course, just calls. <clears throat> the turn, 18,000 in the middle, uh, is the eight. So uh, Garrett makes full house on the turn. Uh, Jen now checks. Garrett bets 8,000 into 18,000, and Jen calls. Uh, the river is a four, uh, and the pot is 34,000, and Jen bets 15,000 after check calling the turn. She bets 15,000 into the 34,000 chip pot. Garrett now sh makes a big over bet to 100K. Jen goes into the tank and calls and loses, obviously. Here. Jennifer Tilly did not come here to fold pairs. He didn't. And <laughs> he yeah. did say, I blocked Queen 10. I blocked the straight. She said that. Sure that's she what she was down. thinking. <laughs> She's got the blockers. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, tough hand for Jennifer. And again, I'm not trying to pick on Jennifer because. Yeah, there's one specific thing about this hand that you just, this is something you just can never do, guys. This is just not a thing, right? When you check call a turn on that board and a complete blank hits the river, you, you don't have a lead. You just, there's no way. Like, even if you had quads, like, you really just, you can't check call turn and lead river on a blank. That's not a thing. Yeah. Tough hand for Jen, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Moving on. Um, the next hand, Tom Dwan limps under the gun with threes. Doyle Brunson with the ace jack off raises to 3,000. Uh, Chris Menon calls with the deuce four clubs. Tom Dwan calls. Uh, they're off to the flop three ways with the King Jack. I think we have way too many hands. Come on. These are, they're all it. I couldn't not pick some of these hands. I'm like, holy <laughs> fuck. They're all hilarious. Like how do we'll I drop the list and We've got a bunch more. Okay. Um, again. So yeah, threes, ace, jack off, deuce, four clubs. Uh, the flop comes King Jack deuce. It goes check, check, check. The turns a three. So Tom makes three threes on the turn. Remember he limp called under the gun. Uh, Doyle has second pair. So Tom checks. Doyle bets uh, 6,000. Uh, Chris Manning calls with a deuce with fourth pair. Uh, Tom Dwan raises to 19,000 with three threes. Doyle calls, again, with second pair, best kicker. Uh, Chris folds. So there are two of them to the river of a six. It's a blank river, 54,000 in the middle. Tom bets 32,000. And Doyle tanks and calls. Uh, thinking that he's going to try and catch Tom, uh, you know, bluffing here with second pair and, of course, is no good. Um, again, here, Doyle, I, you know, I guess maybe this is piling on Doyle a little bit here, but... Why, have, uh, why, what do you, why do you hate this one so much? Uh, well, I guess it's opponent-specific. He and Tom must have a ton of history, and this is, you know, him saying... I think he said something earlier about you're on my, my no-fly list or, or something about staying away from... Uh, Tom, but decided to just just calm down here in this spot. Yeah, yeah so yeah. This, yeah, because this hand doesn't. I mean, obviously, you know, we could see the cards and we know that you know Don, Tom hit a set here, but as played, you know, after a checked flop, like Doyle's relatively high up in his range here. It's not. It's not like in theory, you know, him calling here some of the time is probably fine with Ace Jack. Um, obviously, if we look at how Tom was sort of playing, you know, this season. You know, we, and you know, if you had, you know, if he had that information available to him, maybe he folds. But I, I don't think that Doyle, like, I don't think his call is like way out of line here. Um, after I don't, yeah, after betting turn and getting ready, I don't think it's that out of line. Okay. Um, I guess wonder, I wonder specifically about Tom because he's, you know, from what I've seen, Tom value bets thin a lot of the time. Like he, I can see him with King Queen in the spot taking this line. Um, it seems like, you know, the, the, line he took with a lot of players kind of polarizes them to big hands or nothing uh big hands or air maybe tom's different i don't know is that is that true or no no that you know that you make you bring up a good point in that when somebody's willing to check raise thin for value then you actually should call even less right because that means that their bluffing frequency is even lower right so anytime you see somebody who generally is like uh you know making thin value bet raises by definition what that does is it makes their overall range way too nutted right because they're if they're going to incorporate their good hands their pretty good hands and their nutted hands there's not enough bluffs now right if you can gut all the middle hands and say you know you're polarized where i either have the nuts or i have air well now you know you have to call that player more often but if a player is taking all their value you know to the big betting streets then you can just pretty much fold every time and they'll be doing fine yeah uh, okay, we spent a bunch of time on uh, episode five hands. There's a couple I had there for episode six that are pretty much the same thing where, um, you know, there's a lot of questionable plays. If you want to go watch, episode, uh, obviously, you know, if you have a poker go 
uh, subscription, go watch episodes five and six. They're a lot of fun. This is fun poker to watch, right? Yeah. Was there some crazy hands for sure? And that's what makes it fun. It isn't a bunch of people, you know, raise folding and and not getting it in They They definitely got a bunch of money and pretty light. So that, that makes good TV. So uh, go on, check those out. We'll skip over the uh, uh, episode six hands, but uh, again, go, go watch them for yourself. The other crazy hand that was played since we last did our show was by Mr. Phil Hamath. And this is uh, episode, or sorry, in event nine of the US Poker Open that just completed. This is a $25,000 buy-in. They are down to five players and Phil Hamath is one of the five players remaining. Uh, they are playing 30,000, 60,000 blinds. Uh, Alex Foxen opens with 3.2 million. He opens uh, with nines under the gun to 125,000. Phil Hamath sitting on a stack of 950,000 in the big blind with the queen four offsuit, he three bets it to 350,000 on again, on a stack of three and uh, 950. Fox and jams for uh, his whole stack. It's 540 more to fill. Um, he says something along the lines of, I guess I came to play to win or I need to play to win here. And he calls. <laughs> and I mean, I again, the entire poker world's head just fucking exploded because yeah, Daniel mentioned it earlier. We're coming off maybe the week before where Chino Ream plays a completely standard hand against Phil and he fucking loses his mind. You're the fucking worst. Some of the shit he said to Chino, like and Chino's a, I will take it. He'll sit there and listen to it. He's not somebody who's going to get mad, but he was completely offside again with some of the shit he said to Chino. And we're a week removed from this and Phil plays this hand and ends up sucking it. He makes three queens with the queen four off on Fox and ends up, uh, Fox, uh, Phil ends up finishing second Eric Seidel in this event um, and says something to Fox and about, oh, maybe now you'll respect me or something. Nope. Really <laughs> <laughs> Which, like what? <laughs> people in general are really afraid of me. So Fox had mean, him like several times in that tournament completely dead. Like he, Phil was going to have like, you know, he's not going to remember the hands that he said. Like Fox was super frustrated because he was like crushing him and losing, you know, because he was losing his spots like that. But there's so much to this hand that I thought was awesome because of all the trolls that were born of it. And Phil Galfon, troll of all trolls. This was the greatest <laughs> troll he did. I've ever seen anyone do where he did like a four-page note on defending, you know, Phil Helmuth's Queen Four here. And it starts out on page one. You're like, oh, fuck, he really is. Then page two, you're like, mm, he's okay. Then by, it doesn't take till about page three where you're like, oh, I see. Okay. So he's obviously trolling Phil, making a joke. Because he makes an obvious comment. He says something like, if Phil wasn't the best player in the world or well, something. He says, like, getting two to one when he's a two to one favorite against the range, when he when he knows that it's two nine, nine rank, nine, nine X, nine through six cards. Yeah. Then he's a two to one favorite. It was like, so here's my favorite part of this, okay? So Mike Mattisau tweets it, right? He tweets out Phil Galfon's He, re he retweets it. And yeah. says, bravo, my thoughts exactly, Okay. So I, I text Mike and I say, Mike, you realize that Phil was trolling, right? And I Phil said, Galfon. read it again. And I said, Phil Galfon was, I said, read it again, uh, Mike. I said, read it again. He reads it again and says, I don't see it. <laughs> he says, I don't, I don't see the trolling. I think he's being serious. Oh, <laughs> and then I finally okay. had to take like one excerpt out of it to show him, you know, where he mentions exactly what you said. And that I think that won him over, but like, this is like this is sort of a testament to how Mike Mattisau uses Twitter, where he reads a headline of a title and then retweets the article without actually reading it or understanding it. And often his what he thinks the article says is like directly the opposite of what he thinks <laughs> it does. Like several times he's done that with COVID or whatever. He's like, see you sheep and da-da-da. It's like this. And it's like you read the article and it's like it says the exact opposite of what you think it says, right? Yeah. He does this often, and this is a case of it where he got caught, but there's the last line of the Galfon tweet says, Phil finished second, another recent tactic of his that you're all incapable of understanding. <laughs> like, if Mike can't see that that's, like, just oozing yeah. with sarcasm out of the walls, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, I think my favorite line is, is <laughs> no, one has to wonder if he put several players who folded non-queen uh, A non-queen hand! <laughs> <laughs> I love that he, he added exactly. the math and tried to make it, like, and then, like, Oh, there's another funny, this is a funny fucking thing too, because this is so crazy. Some people were actually trying to defend this fucking call for Queen Four, and they came up with these ranges that Foxen can have and say, look, you know, he's 
He only needs like 30% against his range. He's getting the right price. You know what they had in Fox's fucking range? They had like 10 and 8 offsuit and shit like that, right? So this leads into the funny fucking shit that happens here with Phil because we're talking to him the next day. So first of all, the ranges are ridiculous because, you know, Phil's putting 350 of 950. Fox doesn't think there's any fold equity here. It's just like there's no bluffs, right? He just, you know, he's going to have a hand that he thinks is ahead. So which makes you wonder why doesn't Phil just three bet jam to begin with if he's going to right. he just, like, like what, well, what is the point of making it because he was clicking there? buttons that's what he does <laughs> he's just fucking clicking buttons and here's where he justifies it he tried to bet five hundred dollars okay that foxen only looked at one card before opening as though foxen is going to look at a card and go oh a nine awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah right like you could make the case if you thought it was an ace and somebody looked at one card and was like all right i'm opening all ace rag here but like he looked at a nine, you think? He looked at one card nine. He bet $500 on this, lost that bet, obviously, because Foxen happened to look at both cards. And this was my favorite part the next day when Phil was trying to justify the call. He said, I thought I was ahead at least some of the time. I swear to God, he said he thought queen four high was going to be the best hand some of the time. Like it's Technically ahead of jack 10. So, so, But here's the thing. <laughs> It's completely outside of like, it's so, it, sh it shows such a lack of understanding of like how poker works that he thinks that a Foxen would ever have a hand worse than queen high. First of all, because the hand that you mentioned, like the jack 10, jack 10 suited in an ICM spot, Foxen's probably jamming those hands on the button. It was a button, not under the gun, by the way. I don't know. If it's so, so he's probably just like open jamming those hands, you know, that, yeah. that, that have that kind of equity. But he's, but he's not four bet ripping any hand in the deck that's worse than queen four. There isn't a single. He's not doing it with nine ten suited. You know what? He may actually. Well, he probably doesn't have it. Like I said. Yeah, no, he's just fucking full. He's he just. There's no universe where queen four off is ever ahead when fox and four bet jams. But here's how his brain works. It's like I see fox and three betting with ten five off and you know eight four off all these hands. Right? Completely different scenario because he's he's three betting not committing himself. He's just, you know, looking to pick up chips in an ICM spot. This is, this is like not a spot where Foxen's ever going to think, Hmm, maybe I can get him to lay down a hand, right? <laughs> After putting in 350 of 950, sitting on like 16 bigs or whatever the case may be, thinking he's going to put in six and fold 10 more in, you know, button versus big. So Phil, Phil literally said, because of like his confused by, you know, Fox and three betting with bad hands that he's ever going to be light in this spot. And he thought yeah. that some of the time he'd be ahead with the queen four that went, that went into his equation when deciding to call it off. And, you know, imagine if Phil's the one with the two nines here and somebody has the gall to oh three bet God. queen four off and call it off and then suck out on the nines. Like literally he said, Chino, he, sh he does, they don't even understand. They shouldn't put a penny in with that hand. Right. Yeah. He said that to Chino, that Chino, the chip leader, against the limp and the small and PLO has jack, jack, nine, seven. Okay. <laughs> and you didn't put a chip into the pot when this fucking guy had queen four offsuit against the chip leader in an ICM spot where he wasn't in last. Right. I mean, none as, of those jacks are I have high, to as high that, as the queen. But see for Phil, this is what Phil does. Phil will do this. He's like, no, but he can justify it because he had a read. His fucking white magic told him that yeah. Foxen only looked at one card and it was a nine. Okay. And you knew this, like, like Phil Galfin explained. So, so well with this, you know, theoretical analysis. Hey, is this final proof that the emperor has no clothes? Like he oh, has no, no it's, fucking, he never has like, that. well, that's yes, it is. Right. Thank you. Like, here's the thing. So here's what, here's what Phil does. Phil three bets a lot with trash, right? Most of the time when you three bet somebody, they fold, right? They do. So most of the time they don't have a hand that can call, especially because his sizes are pretty large. Right. So he's going to get away with it a lot, right? When he gets away with it, he thinks he's a mastermind, right? <laughs> Playing fantastic, above the rim, bluffing him. He's like, I bluffed these guys 50 times because he three bet light and they folded, right? It's like... And he does the same with the huge laydowns too, right? So I've, I've got the, the hand from later. I don't know if you saw this hand, this triple draw hand against Brian oh Mikon, where he lays down eight six five four deuce when all when Mikon was like, drew one, just bet every street. He's value betting at 875. And Phil Helmuth is just like, I have an 8-6, I fold. And just throws it in the muck. And, like, sometimes it's brilliant because, like, 
Mike Hunt has that yeah, beat. Sometimes it's actually, but you have to be right like ninety percent right. of the time. Like if Phil, if 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 Mike Hunt had that beat, right? Phil would go on to talk about how an amazing fucking hand that is. But what we, what we won't talk about is what a mathematical atrocity that fold is, right? Yeah. You're getting like twelve to fucking one or whatever the case may be, some eight ten to one on a fucking eight six when the guy can hundred percent slam dunk be value betting. The same or slightly worse will do is he'll focus on the one or few times where he three bets the guy with the, the, the queen four. Oh, like he did it early jam with two five off in the big. Wow. Right. So if you edit it and just does it with queen four off, the guy has nines at, eh, you know, just a little to watch how he's able to do this. And he has a very Trump like following that genuinely believe like anything he says is real. Like he's this genius of all things. I, he knows more, he knows, he knows more about win than anybody. You know, like he voted when he said, I know more about wind than anybody. I know more about the, you know, so, so feel like his, his following, like genuinely believes this stuff. And it's partly because he does such a great job of packaging it as being legitimate. You know, look at, I came second in this thing and da, da, da. Forget about how he got there. And these are two day events and you know, it's going to happen. Like you're just going to have deep finishes. Like he's really good at packaging this stuff as being like otherworldly magic. And also just when the, when the stuff that's bad happens, you know, we'll look past that and we'll justify it another way. Uh, Jason Kuhn had a great tweet. He said uh, it, it, <laughs> his tweet was uh, uh, one out of six tweets, a thread. So he's leading you to believe he's got six tweets here. Uh, here's why the Phil Hama three bet and call off with the queen four wasn't as bad as it looks. Tweet two, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah, and then Kevin Martin had a great tweet about, hey, guys, I found Phil Hummus three-bet call range for value, and Queen 4 is, like, bottom left and nowhere near anywhere <laughs> that should be calling. Yeah, it's like he's got jacks, queens, kings, aces, ace, king, off, and ace, king suited, and Queen 4. And Queen <laughs> <laughs> so, so good. Uh, yeah, no, I know. I, I just – and then I think back, and, you know, there was a lot of talk about Phil's three-bet off 950 to 350 with the Queen 4 off – out of position, which was worse, the three bet to 350 or the call off for 540 more or wherever, whatever it was? Definitely the call off. Like, but, <laughs> but the fact is, like, if he just ripped it in and Fox and just called with the nines and then he said that, that we'd be making fun of Phil, but it wouldn't have lasted for nearly as long. Like, it might have lasted like a day. Yeah. Like, he, he just ripped it in. Oh, whatever. He made a bad read. Fox and had a real hand, whatever. I, like, I would say this you can somewhat you can actually realistically say that the 350 is not that bad in some cases, obviously not with the hand that he had, but like there's a guy who does this in ICM spots and he does it often and he won the last two events and his name is Sean Winter. Sean Winter has on many occasions, like put in half of his stack preflop and folded for the other half, right? Like if you do want, let's say for example, you actually have aces and you want to have like a small free betting range, right? Well, mm -hmm. you can have some, bluffs in there obviously queen four off is probably not the ideal bluff but there's you know in an icm situation when you have 10 bigs and like there's other stacks that have 12 or 15 you can sort of make a case for this as being better than a jam right because it's essentially going to get foxen's range to be identical right foxen's going to respond to 350 and 950 essentially the same way right so if you can, well, he can flat with some of this is like we the problem is that like alex can actually flat some of this stuff right like so if he just opened with like a suited ace or well, something. In this situation, the problem is, is most of the stuff that he would actually flat with, he's probably open jamming himself. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. can sort of eliminate a lot of like the nine ten suited and whatever. But but no, your point is good in that like you're going to let some hand see a flop, you know, for the, for the cheaper price. But as a theoretical ploy, if you will, like I've seen this at work amongst a lot of these guys that will do stuff like this, that where it appears as though they're committed, where they're essentially like, I actually learned this from watching one of Ali's Ali um, Shurovich do this on a stream where he had like 16 or 17. I saw Chidwick do this a lot too, where he was under the gun with like two tens and he opened, he had 500 K he opened for 300 K. Okay. Now why would anyone do that? Right. It's the same thing as 500 K except it's not because if with two tens, if it goes all in and all in behind you, that second all in player doesn't likely have ace King. They likely have your pair beat. So you're not only like from an ICM perspective going to have an opportunity to ladder, you're actually just able to essentially commit yourself, but then get away with still having a stack of like 10 bigs, which is valuable in these things, right? And know that you're not making a bad laydown like ever. 
right? It's a rare situation, but it does come up. And this is what Chidwick, you know, he's done a lot of work on where he like, he's taught people how to sort of like save one bet back or, you know, save four big blinds. And that's why you're seeing some awkward sizes with some opens in situations like that. So, so from that perspective, like, uh, you know, the concept of like putting in half your stack when you have 16 bigs, that's not all that faulty necessarily, right? You can defend that. You can make an argument against that. What you can't really do, I don't think too often in that spot is obviously, you know, well, no, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Sean Winter. He won the last two events of the U.S. Poker Open and takes down the overall championship uh, for that event. Um, we're 60 days away, less than 60 days away from the World Series of Poker, Daniel. Uh, what's your schedule like? Uh, any more clarity around the World Series? Uh, stuff you're Not doing? in Cyprus. I'm telling you, I got fucking FOMO hard. I'm so stupid. Like, I knew I would have FOMO. I always do when Triton Series go on. See yeah. these Because they get a ton of players. You get players. See, the Poker Go Studio, we have a couple things that we – that are just unfortunate. Canadians don't come because of taxes. Europeans, you know, it's harder for them to travel. And the Asian players don't come anymore because fucking Caesars tried to put them all in jail for bookmaking. So, you know, we lose out on those. But in Cyprus, it's sort of available for everybody. So I spent my day today sending hands to Phil Ivey because he was at the final table. Didn't play many or didn't have any interesting situations, but I just basically screenshot them and send it to him um, so he can look at them on breaks or whatever. But I enjoy watching. You know, I enjoy like, uh, you know, watching is fun when it's when you don't know the outcome right most of the poker go streams that i watch you know, already know who wins and it's less kind of interesting but like seeing it and this, they actually did it live live i think like within very very small delay if any yeah. so that was fun. Thought, fun to see okay. ivy ivy i want to talk about an ivy hand because mm-hmm. this one this is one of those phil helmuthian like hands where a lot of people would like give him shit for but i understand it a little more than maybe whatever. so there's a hand where ivy raises in the cutoff he's chip he's like chip leader but the guy on his left has a big stack too. He raised ace jack of diamonds. It's Arthur Martirosian, who's an online, you know, high stakes pro. He flats the button in a blind calls. Comes jack three four of spades. Phil made it twenty four k pre. Jack three four of spades. Hey, Phil has ace jack. He bets forty k in the flop. The button calls. Okay, turns a six, not a spade. Phil checks. Player bets one hundred and seventy k. Phil doesn't think too long and folds the ace jack suit. Okay. Wow. Now, when it surfaced, that's it. Now, I, I won't. What, I won't even tell you what the guy had yet. But what do you think of that as a laydown? Like, what would you think? You know, what do you think of it before I tell you what he had? How, how much money behind on the to, to bet on the river? Then they both started with a. The guy started with about eight hundred k. Fill out about a million. So it's like two side two x pot on the river. He could potentially better something close to that. No, One less half. than that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't so know. How often I, the guy has ace of spades, that kind of hand, right? What's that? How often does he have the ace of spades? He's flatting on the flop to try and hit a spade. Well, and there's then... no spade yet. No, that's what I'm saying. So he has, it's jack three, all spades on the flop, right? Yeah. And Phil has no spades. He has the ace jack, flops top pair. How often does that guy on the button have the ace of spades, the bare ace of spades trying to make a flush? Well, why right? does that matter to you? Like, what is your thought process? Because if he if he does have think? an ace of spades there, let's say he has ace ten off and he decided to flat fill and try and take the pot away or or ace jack even to you know at some point. So now he's let's say he has the base ace base ace ace of spades. He's gonna maybe flat the the turn the flop bet from Phil, <clears throat> and then when it gets checked to on the turn, now he sees an opportunity to take a pot away without hitting a spade and and bets the turn. Okay, so but wh- what the question is, what do you think of Ivy's laydown then? Yeah, so I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is how often does Phil think that player, you know, floated the flop trying to hit a spade or does he have a hand that he's beat against? So, I mean, I guess I, I don't know the player. You mentioned he's a high stakes online guy. I don't know much about him. I don't know his tendencies or how what his range is like there. I, I think it comprises it like ace, ace of spades X should be a fairly small part of his range, I think. Um, so I think what Phil really only has to worry about here is I think is, is sets. I think um, guy probably won't have five, seven, or definitely I would hope doesn't have five deuce. So it's basically sets. So, I mean, I think that's, that's, well, a, sets and that's flushes, not, right. Sets and flop. Flushes. Oh, sets and flushes. Right. Yeah. 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 Cause it's, it's a flop flush. But what, one thing you bring up that Adam didn't get is that he just doesn't have a lot of ASEX combos that are off suit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those ones that play are typically going to three bet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. 
Go ahead, Terrence. You can no, I mean, I'm just trying to think. I don't think I'm capable of doing it, but I mean, I think Phil but has this understanding that he has the of stacks. You think I, it, yeah, like I, th- I think I think what if I'm go- trying to think what Phil's going through, he's gonna he's thinking if I call this one, I pretty much have to play for stacks if a spade doesn't come on the river, right? So 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 that's an interesting that's the interesting part about it because like he didn't even think very long and he folded the hand. Now Archer had King Jack with no spade, so he had the best hand. But Phil is very very live read, you know, he's very very like big on his live reads, right? So it's an interesting situation where if you know or if you feel like your opponent is not bluffing here. Right? How much do you fucking like Ace Jack here? Because as you said, you lose to all flop flushes. You beat a cup. You know, you beat some jacks, sure. But like, you also are in the tough position when you're deep in a tournament where you know, and, and you've got a big stack where you'd have to face a lot of river aggression if it does come a spade or whatever else. Like, can you call it off? So it's nitty. It's on the tighter side for sure. Um, it's you know that's why I said it's a little Helmuthian in that regard. Like, because he would you know he might do something like that. I, I was like, wow, I think that's, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have folded there, but like, so what I tried to do is I tried to think like, what would I be thinking there? And I think he's thinking he's, you know, he's in fine shape in this tournament, right? He's got a big stack. Like he doesn't need to play every really remotely close spot out of position in this spot. Like if the guy bluffs a couple times, so what? But often you're just drawing completely fucking dead, right? Like if the guy actually has value, you're drawing dead here. So what are you doing? You calling to fold the river? You calling to see what comes, you know, like, so, so I actually, in retrospect, if I feel like my opponent is strong there, I think the fold is good for sure. Does the guy think he's value betting there? Yes, of course. He's value. Well, why wouldn't he? Be? Right. Well, you said, I'm just saying, because you said, if he has value, you're dead. And I'm thinking, well, I'm saying most of his value, right. Is going to be flushes sets and some, and here's the thing you have a Jack, right? right? So that means there's only two Jacks left. So that's not a lot of combos of Jack X that he can have. And again, what we talked about earlier, he's going, and he will, this is a guy that will be three betting King Jack off a decent amount. So a lot of his offsuit Broadway combos, he doesn't even have because he three bets Jack 10 off sometimes Jack queen off Jack King off. So, you know, so it's just like the suited Jacks that you beat that are slightly worse and you have one. So when you condense his range and his value range, it's, it's actually very, very, you can beat some of it, but you don't beat the majority of it. So actually, the more I think about it, I think like, again, this is where it's important to not be results oriented, right? Where we look at hands, Phil Ivy plays or Helmy plays and say, well, that was good or that was bad based on the result because the guy had like Phil, Phil, Phil Helmy's jam with five deuce off wasn't good against solver all six, three off, but it worked. So it's good. Just like his queen four off wasn't good. And this time he lost, right? So even though Ivy folded the best hand, the, the layman is going to look at that and say he made a mistake, but against the entirety of a, of, a, of a value range, it's probably just fine to do what he did. Plus, plus, I mean, again, the, the, you, he could potentially face a 2x pot size bet on the river, which he really, really doesn't want to call, uh, even if it's not a spade, to be ICM honest, obviously. A factor. ICM plays a big role. You know, this is yeah. deep in a tournament where, you know, these chips have extreme value. You, you know, you just can't be willy-nilly all loosey-goosey eating a sandwich, you know, when you're playing these pots. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. Uh, we're going to let that go. So the Triton series, yeah, uh, you can check that out online. Do you watch the I was super. I want to say it was super entertaining, uh, uh, you know, and I, I started watching because Daniel tweeted about it and uh, I can understand why he's the FOMO. But I want to say, because Adam and I, on the last show, we got a lot of shit because we started talking about uh, how we thought that that Gabe Kaplan wasn't doing the, the best job on high stakes poker. And, you know, a lot of the arguments is, okay, when, you know, he's, he, you know, he's not there. Now. I just, I, when I, I watched high stakes poker because we're, we're getting ready to do the show. And then I flipped it over to the Triton and listening to, to Ali. And, and like, I think Ali is just like a, just a fantastic play-by-play guy for this. And I see no reason why somebody like that can't, can't do high stakes poker too. I mean, obviously like he's only got so many, so many eyes in the world. I thought Rast did a great job too. I understand they're different formats. One's a super high roller tournament. One's a fun, lively cash game, but I just want to just, I, I thought Ali's uh, commentary really, really added a lot to watching this this tournament. Especially, it's it's a lot harder to commentate. I think something like this, where the players aren't you know being super talkative and entertaining and outgoing, and in fact, in many cases, you know, they speak different languages uh, because it's an international tournament, as opposed to high stakes poker where everybody's just laughing and have a good time and shoving with ten nine into <laughs> into like complete into complete air. Um, so I just wanted to say, like, I was super entertained, uh, by this and I'm not usually entertained by watching Nolan, but tournaments, 
But oh, for the time that I watched it, I thought I thought it was great. I thought Ali did a great job. I thought the poker was fun until it got shallow. And then it can't be a shove fest when it was, everybody was like 18 big blinds deep. That wasn't so fun. But I thought it was a great production. There is no doubt in my mind. And I mean, obviously, everyone is entitled to an opinion that Ali is the absolute best at that role of anybody that's ever done it. Like he's got such a deep vocabulary and a great flow. Yes. And, you know, he, you know, timely jokes like I laughed out loud when they were yes. discussing. So they have a little clock on the table, but it's big. And it's this big block with like a countdown on it. Right. And so, you know, Ali makes a joke about, I, you know, lugging that through the airport and trying to get that on a plane. He's like, maybe Rask can get away with that, but not me. His name is Ali Najad. You know, like he can get away <laughs> with these, like, it's just fucking funny. Right. <laughs> a guy named Ali Najad is going to put that in his backpack and go through the airport and be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Come on through. Right. So a little bit of like that, you know, edgy kind of humor, but he's so on point. He he is like the um, what the fuck's his name now? The guy who hosts uh, the guy who does everything. He's on host of American Idol. Oh, Ryan Seacrest. Ryan Seacrest. He is the Ryan Seacrest of our industry in that regard. But he's funnier. Really slow and like, cause listen, he did come from entertainment. Like Ali used to work in C- with CNN. He was he would have been like huge on MTV. I remember early on in his career, he had the gig. You know, like for you know all that, all those shows and stuff like that. So we're lucky to have them because, like, you're right. I agree. Like, you know, him and obviously when Nick Shulman and them are together, they're like a real good tandem. But I thought also having Rast in there, you know, he brought in a different perspective, and he's very Rast is very like studied in terms of like what he's trying to. He's always trying to teach something in every hand. I think for the listener, which I think is is really good. So does Nick as well. But like, um, you know, Nick's obviously you know done this for a long time. But yeah, that's the A team for sure for me is. Those two. I have I have this classic for you. You're gonna get us in trouble. Yeah, let's take me now. I mean, <laughs> it was from from the uh, World Shut Series. The fuck up, World Ollie. Series. The so you should consider game. meditation. Shut the fuck up, Ali. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Ali. Yeah. That's great. They're, they're, they're awesome. They're a great team. And, and, you know, Terrence, to your point, we got shit. And, and I don't remember saying that I wanted fucking super, you know, um, breakdowns of hands on high six poker. I, that's not what I want. I just want entertaining. And I think back to, um, you know, the early days with the AJ and Gabe, and it was more, enter- in my opinion, everybody's opinion is different. In my opinion, earlier in their careers with high six poker, it was more entertaining than it is now. I just don't, I, I did see somebody make one good point. I thought that was that was real. That was legit. In the old season, because someone said it's, something feels different, right? In the old seasons of high stakes poker, everybody knew everybody. Mm. Right? They played with each other. They had like a, you know they had a banter. Where this season, there's a lot more lineups of people who've like never played with each other before and never yeah. met. So there's not that sort same sort of feel. A little bit of like you know the, that that kind of chemistry. Does it doesn't feel like a high stakes home game? It was essentially what it felt like before, right? Yeah, it is true because you have a lot of fun and really interesting people, but they don't know each other, so they don't have this this rapport. And right. uh, when you see Doral and Ivy sitting at a table with Patrick and Tom, you know these guys are you're like a fly on the wall. You're getting a little glimpse into what happens in Bobby's room, but you know you have new players coming in and you know all that stuff to try to keep the show going. So maybe that you know I could see that being true. But I love the show; it's my favorite. I love the idea behind, you know, edited package shows. We, you know, get rid of the riffraff. I love both, right? You know, you get the, that's what's great about Poker Go now is you have the benefit of the live streams with all the nitty gritty hands. And then you've got the entertainment value with high stakes poker. So best of both worlds, as far as I'm concerned. Indeed, Indeed it is. Uh, One thing I wanted to mention, by the way, is look how long my hair is. Okay? <laughs> so this long hair right here, this was on, this was on, this was potentially getting chopped, Right. But guess what happened? You can tell them. Oh, we'll go. The GG Poker Masters, we talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. It had a $5 million guarantee on $150,000 buy-in. This is the Sunday tournament, the freeze out, one buy-in, $150, $5 million guaranteed. So I'm sure the idea of this tournament, we talked about it, was there is no chance in hell we're going to hit this guarantee. This is a designed overlay. We're going to bring people in. It's going to create a lot of buzz and some money's going to go out the door and oh well, we're going to get it back because all these people are going to find out how great the software is, how great these tournaments are. Um, I guarantee that that was the thought process. Um, Daniel, you stepped out and said, there is no fucking way that we make 5 million. And if we do, I'm getting the clippers out and I'm shaving my lid. And there's a lot of promotion around that. I saw, I saw some cartoon uh, clippers and Daniel's, uh, 
uh, near your near your scalp there that uh, and and we did some uh, predictions. We we thought, okay, well, why don't we have some fun here and see what our predictions are for uh, the five million gun, million guarantee? What are we going to get to? Um, what for the final prize pool, uh, D- Roscoe? We had some predictions. You have them for us. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say I, I signed in to, uh, to to get into the tournament, and uh, I, there was they they did they had animations all over the all over the software of Daniel with clippers oh, dressed did, as yeah. like the guy from Three Hundred. <laughs> um, <laughs> my girlfriend was like, "Does he know that that they <laughs> they did that?" <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So Daniel guessed the lowest at twenty four thousand three hundred. Wow, way, had, way wrong. Way, so low, and we then two thousand one hundred and thirty three entries into the event. Yeah, and I guessed uh, I guessed twenty seven one eighty six, and then uh, and then Terrence prices righted me for twenty seven one hundred and eighty seven. So, and that helped, right? What was Adam? Yeah, Terrence wins. Ta- Adam didn't guess. Adam didn't. Oh. Beautiful. So we ended up with 33,100. This is why you play GTO strategy, right? This yeah. is why I, I price is right at them. I, I won. I maximized my equity and I won. Hey, I'm crazy close though. Yeah, like, that's right. I'm curious as to what the thoughts around head office were. What are the big cheese? What are the people up top thinking <laughs> with 33,000? Well, obviously super ecstatic, right? Cause you know, when you, when you, when you, when you create an event like this, you know, as you said, this is part. This is one of the ways in which Gigi gives back. There's a lot of different promotional ideas you can use, you know, whether it's um, you know loyalty points or you know like there's a lot of different ways in promotions uh, that you can do to give back. And this is what this is one we chose essentially, full well knowing you know that you're you're probably not you're probably going to take a, a hit on it, but it's going to create great buzz as you said. So I think they're ecstatic, you know, because listen, you got to the 4.57 million, so it was about a 400k overlay, you know, which. You know, it's a lot of money, but it could have been a lot worse, right? You could have been looking at, you know, two, three million and stuff like that. And it was a great event. As you saw the winner from $150 buy-in took home like $400,000. Senior duck, congratulations to you. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, but again, like this is part of what always impresses me with GG Poker is that, you know, they're willing to push the envelope. They've got guts. They've got balls. As you can see, you know, we've, um, we've, Part, you know, partnered up with the World Series of Poker, potentially in Ontario, you know, sponsoring them there. They're always looking to make big moves. And, um, you know, in the guarantee space, that's been something that they've been doing for quite a while. I remember when we created this idea, you know, it was 250,000. I'm like, guys, 150 with no reentry. That's a lot. 250. Well, they missed the guarantee first week. So what do they want to do? Double it. I'm like, okay, you guys go ahead, double it, make it 500,000. Good for you. So, uh, so that's what they do. They, they're always willing to, you know, go big or go home kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you, you end up hitting a lot. I mean, sometimes you'll strike out, but generally speaking, they hit very bonds, like amount of home runs, like they, they do really, really well. And I'm, you know, yeah. Yeah, so it was ecstatic time. with the turnout and I'm so glad they didn't quite get there. Cause I woke up that morning going, fuck man. It takes a while to grow out this these locks, you know. Close. Uh, I, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, go to the Vancouver Canucks of uh, Vegas Golden Knights game tonight, where uh, it was a crazy finish uh, after an own goal by uh, Vegas uh, to allow the Canucks to tie it up, win in overtime, and uh, Langley's own Shea Theodore, who beat his hometown team in overtime to score the winner uh, and uh, keep the Vegas Knights playoff drive alive. Um, Daniel, thoughts on uh, on the Knights? I know you buried them. You were like, "There, let's rebuild." Let's they're they're in guy. a tough spot. They've won five in a row, right? Here's the problem: Edmonton's won like four or five in a row. The Kings have won like four or five in a row. Dallas lost tonight, which is big against Seattle. In Seattle, they were they were tired on a back to back. But I don't think you know they 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 they've Dallas still has three games in hand, so they're in tough. Like they keep winning, but the problem is, is they're playing teams that keep winning too. I'll be there Wednesday night, my first hockey game in quite a while, and I'll be, you know, we'll be home to the Vancouver Canucks. We're going to have to win that one. I said going into this trip, you know, Seattle, Seattle, Vancouver, 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 Arizona, they have to go at least five and one. And so yeah. far they've done the work, you know, they've won five straight um, on this stretch playing some weaker teams. I really do think having Martinez and Braden McNabb back is huge. And of course we had Robin Lehner back for his very first game and he looked great. I thought, you know, the goal that you talked about was impossible. The two goals that he let up were like, none of them were even remotely on him you know yeah. so so yeah you know it was an exciting game they almost blew it to up to nothing in the third and had those delay of game penalties but an exciting finish i had more importantly my fantasy hockey yeah i was gonna ask you okay. was gonna ask. 
So I'm in the, my fantasy hockey league, which is my favorite thing in the world, and I'm way too obsessed with it. I'm in the conference finals, game one tonight. I got I need all I need is an assist or a goal from Jason yeah. Robertson or Rupi Hans, Rup, Jason Robertson or Rupe Hans with a whole game to play. I also have Cody Cece with 10 minutes, but I mean it's Cody Cece in Edmonton. Not Jason Robertson, he gets nothing. Not Rupe Hans, he gets nothing. But Cody Cece pulls out an assist. So a 4-4 game. I win it in overtime, take a one nothing lead in the conference finals. Uh, nice. On to game two. Exciting stuff for nobody but me. <laughs> I, was, I looked at the Dallas school. I, I knew that you needed uh, that point out of Dallas. And I was, you're in a good mood the whole podcast. I'm thinking, what happened? You're in a good mood. <laughs> Cody CC. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks to you guys for getting together uh, this week. Uh, thanks to you out there for listening. And uh, we will get back to you shortly with uh, some more discussion about uh, all kinds of stuff for uh, the high stakes poker episodes that are coming up and uh, more stuff happening in the poker world as we get ready for the world series of poker. I'm booking my trip, Terrence. Are you, uh, you're going to get down for the scene? I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked early. Like I said, I can only go the first part because uh, we got a baby on the way in July. So I can't, uh, it would, it would be, I, 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 I get in a little trouble. I think if I miss the birth of the child. So I'm going to try and go for the early part of the world series. You can get a, some 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 poker dads. They get away with it. Eh, I mean, maybe maybe I would get away with it, but but I'm not going to find out. There you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks everybody again. Uh, we will talk to you soon. Peace. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>